Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's a Friday, it's a quiet day. Um, but because I'm recording and because this is important, a little bit of important information once going over it, it I hope will answer some questions that you may not know you have yet. So with that, uh, I'll go through this, and for anyone who is not here, including those who are not in, you know, who are online, you'll be able to listen to the recording. I am referring, this is for folks online, uh, for the most part, up until this point, even though I have a PowerPoint, you can just go ahead and follow the book at, with what we have. However, once we get to new information, I have information that uh, is coupled with a, um, a PDF article that I have uploaded to the home page that you feel welcome to look at more closely, but it's a very long article. I think it's over 100 pages. Uh, maybe it's not quite that much, but it's the first 30 pages or so that I'll be referring to in this class, and I'll explain why in just a, a few minutes. First, I want to just get us back on board. We were talking about having an environmental scan. We have these three areas that we're going to be, these four areas that we're going to be looking at when we start looking internally at the organization, the theory of change program portfolio, the business model, organizational capacity and leadership. We talked about that last week. But first, we're going to take a broader is going to step back and look at the organization essentially from the outside looking in. And with that, you're looking at also the environment that your organization or your agency is in. And as I said on Wednesday, in one sense, you've already done this. But looking at this process now and seeing it, you can be more strategic. Now you can say, oh, did I do that? Have I, have I been as strategic as I want to be in my environmental scan? So, so we talked about the five core dimensions of planning that I just mentioned um, going over and why we do an environment, environmental scan. Some of the issues that we'll be looking at both through change issues. Remember, when you do the environmental scan, you're doing little, sort of a preliminary look from the outside in at change, business model, organization, capacity, and leadership. Okay. Your book talks about scenario planning. I devote about a page to scenario planning. Have you read that? Do you have any questions about, about it? Did it make sense? So scenario planning, one of the reasons, by, by the way, one of the reasons I chose this textbook is the fact that it's not as detailed as uh, some of their other textbooks. These are folks who are nationally known, and they have other textbooks that are pretty awesome. but are really more geared to a graduate level course. One of the reasons I chose this book is because it doesn't get so deep that you're gonna get lost in the process. Unfortunately, because of that, occasionally they'll skip over a concept where they just sort of introduce it and, and move on. And I wanna spend just a little bit more time with it so that uh, you have a clear, or a clear idea of what they're talking about and why they would be talking about it. Not so much so that you would do scenario planning, but you know what it is, and when you run into it, you go, hey, I know about that. And also, if you decide that you're working with an agency that, you're, that a scenario planning would be helpful, then you've got a few resources you can go to and use it. So scenario planning is used when status quo is not an option. So the article I have lists times when you consider whether or not you would be doing scenario planning. If you have an organization with, where their structure is pretty, pretty set, you're not in a position to go in and, and change it up a great deal, 
when its future is pretty certain and you're not going to be doing big, big changes, then scenario planning is probably not a, a good idea. So in the case of the uh, district attorney's office, scenario planning just doesn't fit. In Scott's case, he's working with adults with developmental disabilities where pretty much everything they do, the funding is pretty structured and set. Their processes are pretty set. If they were going to be doing something um, really creative, it's almost uh, if it would almost be preferable that they have a par they partner with an agency that has the flexibility to be creative and reach out beyond basic services for adults with developmental disabilities. So scenario planning is not necessarily the best thing for him. Um, scenario planning for, I'm thinking Sherry, I'm talking to you as far as the volleyball team. You're wanting to step beyond what, what is going on and you have a focus of building uh, community support and enthusiasm for the program. You might want to do a little bit, a sort of simple scenario planning, but if it had to do with changing the program, and I'm now thinking of what Casey is working on with cheerleading, uh, she's looking more at refining what's already in place that's pretty well set and doesn't have options for a lot of changes. So she would not necessarily. So it's what if planning. You're looking ahead. You're looking into the future. You're looking at possibilities. So scenario planning can increase, and this is what your book says, to increase readiness to respond to uncertain changes. Can you think of some situations where we just don't know what's going on, or we do, we may have an idea of what's going on, but we know the future is going to change things a lot. Do you have any ideas that where it might work? Probably. Yeah, well, and you've got, and I would guess, I would hope that our candidates have gone through a form of scenario planning for how they would leave based on whether or not uh, their party is in power. So on one extreme part, they have a majority in Congress, and, and on the other extreme, they're the minority. Uh, and it could also be other factors. What might some of the other factors be? Now, they're gonna, if they're going to do scenario planning in their vision, they're winning, right? Legislature and budgets. Budgets, yes. Uh, and you know, if you have too many factors, you can only use two at a time, really, to, to work with it. So I'm going to go through that, too. But uh, OK, budget is an issue. Uh, the budget is approved, the budget isn't approved, could be on the other one. So you'd end up with, and if you look at, uh, in your book, they have that two-way matrix. And so budget not approved. I can't spell. And budget approved. That's on one continuum. And they're in the majority in Congress, they're in the minority, their party is. And so they would set up these contingencies and start out and say, what if? What if we have an approved budget but, and we're in the majority? Best case scenario, right? What if we're in the majority, but we don't have an approved budget? What if we're in the minority and we don't have an approved budget? That's going to be the toughest one. But you actually have a quadrants where you're thinking about what if. Can you see how important it would be that if you're going to do scenario planning for your agency, that you don't try to do everything? So uh, let me step back a little bit. In the handout that I have uploaded, they talked about three guiding principles. 
One of the advantages of scenario planning is it gives you a long view. It helps you stand back and look into the future. So you get a long view of, of what's possible. And it's outside in thinking just as any environmental scan. That's why your book in, uh, introduced it at this point. It almost feels like they stepped out of sequence to introduce this. But it's because scenario uh, planning is a part of standing back, looking at possibilities. Okay. And that in the process of scenario planning, your, your goal is to get multiple pr perspectives, all, many perspectives, some of which you may not like hearing, some of which you might. Hopefully, you'll be able to create some synergy where you get thinking that wouldn't have come if you hadn't opened it up to all sorts of possibilities. So they talk about uh, several different steps. If you decide you're going to engage in scenario planning, you mentioned the fact of the election process. I have seen scenario planning mo very often within communities when they're trying to do grassroots changing. Uh, our community action agencies are going through a time where they have an uncertain future of funding, where most of the agencies now, community action agency is, uh, receives some core funding with federal programs, but they also run programs that are either uh, funding through the state or their federal programs, but they also have the ability, and many of, many of the most dynamic ones also receive different funding from so many different sources. But it's uncertain, especially the federal funding is uncertain in the future. There's a tendency to get away from federal funding, and yet the services are needed. So to be able to look to the future and say, what do we do? What are our priorities? And you can't do it all at once, so the first step is to stand back and talk have focus group meetings, interview people, try to get a, a broader perspective from a variety of external stakeholders. What will the future look like? So you're trying to vision what will the future look like? And based on different, different scenarios, but it'll be important to identify what your book calls the critical future developments that are possible but not certain and with HRDC, uncertain funding is one of them, okay? I've seen this also work with communities that wanted to, they stepped back and they were going through distress and they wanted to build a stronger infrastructure that was more inclusive. And the example I'm thinking of now, I've seen examples in a number of communities. The two, I, I know of some specific examples that have happened in Cincinnati, Ohio, partially because that's where my, my son took his uh, urban planning degree, so he talked about it. Uh, also because uh, I have been fortunate enough to interact with a consultant who helped with some of the scenario planning for smaller agencies in Cincinnati that wanted to work on empowerment within neighborhoods and communities. And so they identified that neighborhood, they identified what it was, and brought the stakeholders from those neighborhoods together, the number of different initiatives that took place in Cincinnati. The example I'm thinking as far as Dayton, Ohio, which is uh, where my daughter lives, is that they have, they wanted to, again, be more inclusive. They wanted neighborhoods to have more individual power and self-direction. And so they brought together representatives from all the identified neighborhoods from within town, the town and worked first from the, uh, yes, from the outside in, but also uh, working from the larger view down to, uh, to give the strengths to within the neighborhoods that there would be neighborhood representatives then the neighborhoods themselves would build their neighborhood co coalitions. And my experience has been, oh, they've received awards for what they've done. 
And some neighborhoods have been absolutely stellar and some of them less so. And I guess you'd expect that in a town that at the time had a population of about 160, 170,000, that some of the neighborhoods would step forward and say, this is really cool. And some of them, people would just say, oh, you want to do that? That's fine. So, uh, but you step back, you look at it and say, what would it look like? In the case of the neighborhood coalitions, they did have a, uh, a set vision of what it would look like with all the neighborhood coalitions working together for a positive whole. But there would be also scenario planning within the neighborhood so that each neighborhood would develop its location, its community, based on how they envisioned themselves, how they saw themselves moving into the future. So their critical development criteria would be different. First step then, orienting and identifying one or just a couple of key factors that you want to focus on as you envision the future. And then explore the critical uncertainties in light of the predetermined elements. What are the predetermined elements? What do we already know about? What do we already know about uh, HRDC? Well, predetermined elements are, okay, they have a pretty solid base already of established programs, right? And so you start thinking about all the strengths they're bringing to it. You also consider about uh, what are the uncertainties in light of those more, those other more stable elements too. So first identify, then you explore. When you're exploring, you're doing a bit of research too. You're gathering as much information as you can about the situation. So with each one of your projects, remember I've said, take this opportunity to find out everything you can about your program. How is it funded? What are some of their issues? Because even if you're not doing scenario planning, you want to know where they're coming from. You want to know what their mindset is. You want to, to, uh, you want to get inside of their mind too. With the scenario planning, you're also then stepping back and saying, how do the external stakeholders see it too? So the third step, once you've identified a few critical issues and you've e explored all the factors surrounding that, then you want to synthesize. And that's when you use this matrix that's in your book of take a couple of factors and measure it out and consider what will happen if, you know, you're going you're gonna to say one factor could be uh, in the case of HRDC, uh, federal funding continues, uh, state funding, funding becomes more secure, Another, but, but the opposite of that is losing critical funding. Pardon me? Yeah, and, and yeah, and you're saying contributions, donations, right now, uh, of the HRDC programs, the ones that get a lot of donations, well, the food bank wouldn't be there without donations. They, they exist almost exclusively on community contributions. The uh, Head Start ha gets a lot of contributions, both in-kind, meaning people volunteer, and they get funding that helps supplement. Most people don't know that. The federal support, but most of that is federal support. But if they lost the community contributions, would that be, is that a factor to be concerned about? And it should be a factor to always concerned about it because that's something where there isn't the ongoing, there might be an emotional commitment, but you don't know year by year if you're gonna get the volunteer, the, uh, the, the contributions if we hit a uh, financial crisis, how will that fit? If we hit a point at which um, HRDC becomes much less popular, not that it is super popular, but uh, something comes up where they become suspect as far as credibility, <laughs> I would expect the contributions would just go through the floor. Um, but 
to consider whatever factors. Let's even just say the federal and state funding, they receive it, they don't receive it. Uh, that, uh, or even it could be because actually they are subcontracting child care program, but they used to actually be running the child care, not the child care, the ch uh, child care support program. The, um, what is that called? No, it's the Ch Child Care Link. Yeah, Child Care Link, which is a support system for people who provide child care. And they used to get the state funding. They used to actually be direct, they have their, their headquarters right there. It was refigured, and right now they have, instead of a one and a half positions, for that they have, I think, one part-time position because it's being administered elsewhere. So that is, you know, that could be a factor too. Are they going to be able to continue to have um, self-directedness or self-determination on, on their programs? So to take that and then consider the possibilities in every case synthesize it using that two uh, that two-way matrix and if you're wanting to do that I don't think your book tells you enough about it to follow it but the handout I gave you does it'll walk you through it that what I would say would be part of the ex exploration where you're gathering information but if you're looking to the future and remember the purpose of the of the scenario uh, planning is to anticipate the future. Uh, I was listening to, because I was trying to find a good video, but I didn't find one I liked well enough. But one of the people said it's like looking around the corner, getting uh, the, um, the analogy that was made was that in a city, is, you know, sometimes those parking garages and you're pulling into the city, the street and you can't see what you're doing. So they set up mirrors so you can see what the traffic that's coming through the mirror. And it's sort of like setting it up so you have a mirror to look around the corner to see what's coming up and think about possibilities. It was through scenario planning that was identified years ago, and this is tragic, but identified years ago that the, um, the levy in New Orleans was at risk of breaking. There was a big t hurricane coming in maybe two or three years before Katrina. And they were saying the, the hurricane's coming towards New Orleans and this, this, uh, the lake and the levee are not strong. They're at great risk for breaking. And there was all sorts of concern. And sure enough, we got through that hurricane no problem. Did they go in and strengthen their infrastructure at that point? They had done the scenario planning, saw it as a risk, but the action did not take place. So they got this far in the scenario planning. Now, the tragedy comes, and, and uh, I have that in a little bit. You need the infrastructure. You need to have some key elements, and one of them is the leadership to be able to allot the resources you need in order to carry out the results of your scenario planning. So this is the step four is act, and this is when you need the resources to use the scenarios to inform and inspire action. If you see a train wreck coming and everybody agrees that we have a train wreck coming, you don't just say, oh, you know, oh no, this is horrible, you say, okay, what's possible? And you can even use the threat of, of danger to step outside the box and, box and say, where do we see ourselves going? Using this two-way matrix, best, best case scenario, how do we avert this train wreck? So. To, to act, the key to success in taking action is being able to envision it, come up with an agreed upon, this is going to be pretty much 
uh, you need to have enough power behind it so that it's, it's pretty much a consensus or you've got a critical mass of agreement behind you and that you as a body, not just you as the researcher, but those stakeholders that are involved are, are committed to learn, to adapt to the changing environment, and to take effective action. And then once you take the, uh, if the action, and one of, the, one of the lessons with any kind of planning is it never comes out as you anticipate it's going to come out. Has that been your experience too? So you always, you not only have to take the action, but you're going to learn as you go. Anytime you make change, I've never known of an exception. I've known of times when it went really, really smoothly. It was really pretty awesome. But even then, there were mistakes made. The more strategic, more realistic and strategic you can be, the more people you have involved who can give you perspectives, and the more you get uh, individuals committed to the process, the fewer mistakes will be made, but there will still be adjustments needed at any point. And one of the things that your handout points out is very often when there is a dynamic scenario planning and it's like, it's like any strategic planning, you can make the plan, but if you put it on the shelf, it's not going anywhere. So the hardest part is getting, one, first to action, getting the resources, and the next hardest part, because by that time, by the time you are implementing it, people are tired, their resources are stretched thin, their energy is less because they have put all their energy into getting it launched, uh, that it often is not monitored and then the adaptations don't take place as they need to. But it can make huge, huge difference. So, this is from the handout. Success is dependent on, I've mentioned most of this, openness to hearing multiple perspectives and challenging community held assumptions, ability and willingness to change. Change theory says most people don't change unless they're feeling really uncomfortable. If people are satisfied with the current situation, it's hard to create change, but, and then if people are feeling insecure, they'll, they're more likely to dig in their heels and try to hold on to what's stable, what they perceive to be stable. So the ability and willingness to change in meaningful ways and to have a well-positioned leader in the pro for the process. And I can tell you having a well-positioned leader makes, a, makes all the difference too. Yeah, somebody who can articulate to those who are skeptical, who can keep in mind the basis on which uh, items were discussed and decisions were made, making sure that that, um, that discussion takes place. People who, are, again, who are really trusted by all parties involved. So last year, I was appointed to be the uh, campus representative for prior learning assessment, which is an up and coming thing. That's the conference I went to last, about three weeks ago. And I landed in the middle of a process that had taken, it was in, entering its third year. But uh, on the state level, a, a statewide prior learning assessment process had been approved by the Board of Regents for higher education in the state. And I came into it at the point at which all campuses were being called upon to build on, because they were committed to each campus being able to uh, implement it in their own way, to build their own policy. And so over the course of the spring, planning takes a lot of time, by the way, takes it, to really good planning can take a lot of time. Over the course of the sp spring, we used the state prior learning assessment policy 
and many, many meetings with everybody we could identify as a stakeholder. And we being a group of individuals, um, mine was designated, the registrar was designated, but everybody else who was a part of it volunteered, but they really got to know policy backwards and forwards. And to, in coming up with the individual policy that we have for Northern, the whole purpose was to make it so it fits Northern's needs at the same time it is in agreement with the state policy. So that was great. We got it approved through the faculty senate just in time for summer and then it sat for the summer. It is still just, just, just this fall picked up again but remember we had a summer in between and it's going to a different level. It's going to the administration, who was a part of the discussions last year, but administration, our administration has a lot of things they worry about. And it took constantly reminding the provost, the chancellor, the other people in the administrative staff, how, what the state policy was and how it fit, because they forgot that this item came straight from the state policy, it wasn't somebody's brainchild, or how, how it was agreed upon. So last, last spring there was a lot of unity of focus. It takes a leader to be able to keep that focus going over a period of time when, when situations change. And that's what it took. And actually it was, it was approved yesterday afternoon with the help of the registrar who attends those meetings. I, I'm only invited in when I'm needed. But the registrar who went in and was able to point by point explain every question that came up in the light of, of the state policy. So I mentioned openness to hearing about it, ability to, and willingness to change, having a well-positioned leader, and also being willing to commit the necessary resources. That's where things broke down with uh, with the levy initially. They just were not, they didn't have the resources, they didn't know how to get the resources, and as I mentioned, sometimes it's impossible to get powers to move at a potential danger, and aren't we really good at, re at letting crises happen and responding afterwards? And that was one of those situations. There are a couple of other ones too, but Unfortunately, I don't want to get depressed over all the times where we can see something going and we can, it happening and we have a scenario, an, uh, uh, a scenario analysis where action is proposed but um, the funding doesn't come because there are probably just as many times when there's a scenario analysis and action is proposed but it's not fully, fully researched and if it is funded, it might not be the most uh, judicious of funding and nobody wants to pay for things that aren't. So you've got to have one, the well thought out policy, you've got to have the accountability factor, but also the ability to get the necessary resources when it is so key. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Okay. That's the, uh, the scenario planning, that's it. Any questions about scenario planning? If you run into it, you know what it is, you'll recognize it. I think you're going to be running into it no matter what you're doing because it can, it can be really dynamic. It can create awesome change in your community. Uh, whether you are, whether you're involved with law enforcement, whether you're involved in corrections, whether you're involved in business, you're going to run into scenario planning. Okay. So I'm going to go back to, because your book goes back to, an environmental scan where you take a scan of the environment, you look at all these factors, you consider whether or not you're going to do a scenario plan. But even without that, you're standing back and you're looking at, in, at the uh, agency from the inside out and you are gathering information whether it's part of a scenario plan 
or just a gathering information to know more about the agency and possible needs. And as a result, this is where you're going to go. You've been gathering information. I haven't been perhaps as structured as I should have been in making sure you gathered all that information because I really wanted you to get connected with your agencies and you're all, each one of you working with a different factor. But organize your research to summarize your finding. What information have you gathered? And is it together? Some of that information came, came, was brought together when you did your proposal. And I don't mean the IRB proposal, I mean the proposal you submitted before you did your IRB proposal and you said, this is what I'm finding out, this is what I'm proposing to do. But you have probably found information since then. And based on your research, you're going to identify and prioritize what changes and trends are taking place. And some of that will come from the primary research, meaning the interviews and surveys you're doing. So you're not ready to, uh, to do that, that's going to come at the end of your gathering the information. Okay. And also, as a result of gathering all that information, you'll be able to spell out the implication of these changes uh, for your agency. This is the so what. So you found all this out, now what? Some of you, actually many of, all three of you, have anticipated how those findings may impact. But, and I've told you, step back, don't assume it yet. But at the stage of once you've gathered the information, once you've analyzed the information, now it's time for, so what? And if you're thinking about expanding uh, the wellness center, John, or uh, looking again and expanding a service that's already offered at Salvation Army, Look at your data, stand back, and try to be totally objective. I know you'd like to do that. Do your findings support that? And that's true for the additional programming you're talking about as far as public defender's office. Okay. So consider the need for additional research. Every time I've done an analysis and program planning, I almost always will come to the point where it's time to propose something, but I can almost always tell you what else I would, what additional information I would be gathering if it weren't time to act now. And sometimes, even though it would otherwise be timely to act, I realize that not only is more information needed, more often it's the fact that the stakeholders aren't on board yet. And the stakeholders aren't on board, it's not going to do anybody any good to force it through. So it's time to step back and say, okay, we need to do more research, which means also carry out more conversation, keep, uh, and keep that listening ear because probably what you are proposing might be an excellent idea but it doesn't quite fit with the local perceived need. And maybe really hearing others and continuing to hear others, then your other people perceive needs too. To be able to uh, blend it, to look at it in such a way, and it may come out that you're proposing one structure and it's really something else that the community is ready for. And then, but, when you cut to this point with your research, which I hope you get to in the next three weeks, you're going to consider the need for additional research, and I hope you state that in your report. You know, it would be, if you anticipate it, to say it would uh, additional knowledge on and then tell us where you would do the additional research if you could. And then you'll prepare a summary that identifies key issues and their implications for the agency. So in a way, you're going to be proposing a change, but if you're finding through your research that it's not timely or there are other issues involved, then really what I'm looking for from you is an analysis of the situation and a recommendation for action even if the action is to conduct more research or action if the action is to say we need to continue dialogue or even it could be that based on your findings, 
your initiative, it, it doesn't appear to be feasible. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's perfectly, in fact, that's what I want from you, is to do a realistic analysis of the situation. So to say, this is not time, or there's not, because due to lack of support, due to a, a higher perceived need by the stakeholders, it could be for a lot of things. It could be resistance to the idea. Or it could simply be, and you might find out, I've found this out too, that I have been trying, taking action with others to try to address what I perceived as a need and realize that probably that, that wasn't the need, it was something else. And that's okay. Okay, any questions? So I have, you have two concurrent assignments. Uh, at this point, everybody who's in class today, almost, most people actually have completed their IRB proposal, or if it's not complete, it's almost complete. So it'll be in, and as, you, as you're finishing up, gather all, everything you need, make sure you have your instruments in place, but also that you're gathering as much background information as you possibly can so that in a week, you can spend the week of November 6th working on gathering your information. And then also, of course, there is the, um, the worksheet for Chapter 4 that is uploaded as far as I typeset it. So, uh, so you can just use the questions that are in your book, but it's in a Word document, so you shouldn't have formatting issues. Okay, so I'll be looking for that as well. Are you good? <laughs>